Previously on Circuit Breakers. Mahindra, first round in the points. I think that they are going to score some points in Monaco. Today on Circuit Breakers. Into the barrier has got one of the cars. Got Marvin Voltara. It is. Welcome back to Circuit Breakers on the Tales of the Monaco E Pre. Taylor, how was this race? Oh, it was a Monaco race, Dallas. It was a very, very different Monaco race than I think we had seen sometimes in the past. Uh, but it was a pretty intense race. I love this track, mainly because it's a place where I don't think I'll ever be in a tax bracket to ever visit. So it's really fun to see through a screen of like, wow, that's what absurd wealth looks like. Yeah, I mean, can you imagine we just roll up to uh, to to the bay in a dinghy uh, and try to watch the race? A little rowboat. We wouldn't even be able to see the the yachts are too tall. Well, and I was thinking about that too, like just the juxtaposition between a circuit like Monaco and then knowing just in like two months' time it'll be in Portland where there are a gaggle of tents outside of the track and it is so yeah. far from that place on Earth. Yeah, uh, RVs is uh, is the yacht of Portland. <laughs> Just old <laughs> RVs old that have been parked Winnebago's. on a, on a yeah that have been parked on the street for six weeks. Well, that's one thing you have to love about the sport is just the it's for everyone, uh, whether you're it's rich, whether you're poor. It's it's time to race now. Did you catch the big reveal? right before the race with the Gen 3 Evo. Dallas, I was checking for updates every like five minutes to see what they were going to show us. Um, they said that they sent out that like little teaser where they're having that go so fast. You can't like, I was like pause freeze framing <laughs> to see like, well, what's the wing look like? What's the wing look like? Is there, you know, what, what kind of, what are we dealing with? Um, but then it was finally revealed and I, Dallas, they gave us everything we wanted for the Gen 3 Evo. I am blown away. And they by listened everything, almost. you mean a reinforced front wing, at least by the photos, what it looks like. Well, a more durable front wing. Uh, I don't think it's going to be reinforced where it's like impervious to damage, but I think it is going to be, it's designed specifically to take a little more punishment and to not... Uh, explode if someone sneezes in its direction. <laughs> yeah. um, but the thing that I was most excited about when they were talking about this is it's something that I had no idea how it was going to be implemented or if it was, but the all wheel drive uh, mm. front powertrain activation in this, which is going to have a multitude of applications in the race, being in duels at the race starts and an attack mode. So attack mode is no longer just a joker lap, but it is going to be an activation of your front powertrain, which is just going to give you everything you need for launching. Um, and Dallas, speaking of launching, zero to 60 in 1.82 seconds. The only cars that are like specifically faster um getting up to speed are like the Remats Nevera uh, hypercar, uh, which does it, I believe, in 1.65 or 68 seconds or, or something in that vein. Uh, and then the uh, McMurtry Spurling, which is like a single-seater race car that has fans that suck it to the ground so it has like a 1,000 pounds of downforce standing still. Um, and that's like the fastest. That's like 1.4 or 5. It's literally uh, like a jet being launched off of an aircraft carrier. Yeah. <laughs> um, Dallas, I, I'm pretty sure like my car takes 1.8 seconds to figure out that I've hit the gas pedal. Yeah. Like it is so fast. <laughs> it is insane. So I, um, I had to look it up because – Obviously, with this upgrade in zero to 60 time, there's a lot more power, 600 kilowatts to be exact. I had to look up my electric car because I was curious. I was like, how, how close am I to this? Because being an electric car, you have that flat torque curve. So, I mean, my car can get up and go, and then it's just a slow, big hunking turd. I'm running with 111 kilowatts of power. So, 
what is that? A sixth of what's behind these cars? It's absolute lunacy. It's it's stupid. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they, they quote that it has a 200 mile an hour top speed. I, we're never going to see that from the car because of the circuits that we race on. Right. It's never going to be accomplished um, because that's like the point of the series is that you stay in that lower speed bracket so that you can uh, showcase the speed to acceleration that these cars produce and maximize. But I think the big thing is there's been some like test drivers for this thing and they say that it's like driving on rails. So the amount of grip is massive. We have new Hankook all weather tires for like 10% more grip, uh, which is exactly what they need. And then on top of that, you have the all wheel drive for launching uh, control. Um, getting in and out of corners, probably a little bit quicker, a little more tidy. Um, and I have like two thoughts on this, right? Um, because these cars were really challenging to drive. They're a little squirrely. They're hard to fully understand how to make right moves, which has led to um, really good tight racing, uh, but also I think less confidence to make bold, dramatic moves. And I think we're going to the exact opposite end where we're giving them an absurd amount of grip and control for the power that they're using. Um, I wonder if this is going to make the racing far more chaotic uh, because they have more confidence to take radical moves. I think they're going to take them more often because like, if I don't think I can make a move, I'm realistically not. If I feel like I need to make a move and I don't think I can make it, it's probably not going to stick and I'm probably not going to have the tools I need to make it happen. If I have just the confidence of a BMW driver on the freeway, like <laughs> to just do whatever the hell I want. I'm going to make radical outrageous moves. And I feel like it is going to cause a lot of insane, insane action on track and moves on track. Um, so fingers crossed that this is going to be, the leap in racing that just makes this series even more dynamic and friendly to spectators for just what can happen in a race. So arguably the greatest gen three overtake, I would say, I feel like you would agree with me was in Cape town last year with Antonio Felix da Costa whipping his nuts out, passing John Eric Verne. Do you think that that pass, which has been over a year since that happened, passes like that will become commonplace in the Evo? I I think they might. I mean, it's going to lean way more towards those strategic uses, I think, of attack mode. I think like attack mode is going to be a huge boost now to where it was before. Because if you're thinking about it right now, attack mode is just giving you a little bit of additional power over straights. Um, it's not helping you in the turns whatsoever. It's actually almost hindering you somewhat in the turns because you have so much more power at your disposal. It's hard to put it down. Now coming in and out of corners, uh, you're going to have significantly better exit speeds that you can provide, uh, which means that those moves leading into corners or going around the outside are going to have far more imp like impact when you have attack mode. So I think attack mode is going to go from being this like joker lap thing to now being a very strategic, how do we take it and best utilize it to make dramatic moves where we need them. Um, so not having attack mode is going to be a point where you know you're at a disadvantage to the car behind you. Right. right. So that's going to change the defensive ways that they're driving, which I think is also going to be, how do I make stupid moves that are potentially going to destroy two race, two drivers races. Now, and these, this uh, Evo car shows up at the beginning of next season, correct? That's right. Yeah. So fully implemented and racing next season. Uh, I think that's probably what's going to be used with attack charge also. Um, Allegedly. I don't whoa, know if they're just going to, I don't know kids. if they're just going to get rid of <laughs> attack charge entirely, but it's like, it seems like they're really pushing that this is going to have more implementation on the Evo than it is this one. Cause it's not, I don't think it's coming out this season. Yeah. I uh, just agree. needed more time to bake, uh, but I also don't think it's going to enhance the racing. I think they're going to find with attack mode, you're going to get the racing you're looking for. So 
Who knows, Dallas? Um, it's never easy to predict things in this series, but there are some things that we can speculate on and hope for, and then it just shows up exactly how we want it. Do you think the FIA is going to highlight the throttle spring on the approved uh, dimensions and, and parts for this Evo? For Porsche's sake? I do, yeah. For Porsche's sake, I think that they are going to leave it off of their uh, parts calendar specifically um, and just say that it was always in there. Uh, but we'll have to see. Uh, a lot of people considering um, that not all the teams are fairly treated in Formula E. So we will find out. Well, when you have an artificial intelligence behind the wheel of one of your cars, I don't know. It's it's up for debate. Now, tell me about some other artificial intelligences operating uh, fast cars. Yeah, Dallas. Uh, well, we covered a little bit of it last episode um, in preparations. Uh, the A2RL, the Abu Dhabi Autonomous Racing League, um, was set to kick off last weekend. Um, and, you know, we had a lot of doubts, and it turns out that it was rightfully so uh, because <laughs> it was uh, it was one of the greatest spectator races anyone could have ever hoped. Um, there were cars that um, couldn't quite understand what an overtake was. Uh, we had confusion on the AI's behalf of what green flag versus yellow flag was. <laughs> yeah. um, it had uh, panic codes about going around a corner. Um, yeah, this is a, <laughs> this was, this was its own special display of um, how far off uh, most programmers are to what Porsche was able to develop in a test tube. Now, to be fair, Porsche's had, what, 30 years of development with Pascal. Uh, these teams for the A2RL, yeah. they only had two months. So that, that was, for what it's worth, I want to give them some credit because they're doing something that I think you and I completely over our heads as far as programming. Uh, that's impressive. But then when you actually put it into function, it's like this is an unbelievably tragic shit show where <laughs> yellow flag, like you said, the AI just thought, oh, yellow flag means don't pass at all when there is another car stalled on the straightaway. In the qualifying event where they were going head to head of how many overpasses or overtakes could each car achieve in the session, and then this is what happens. I mean, it it's hilarious. Uh, by just <laughs> it's now it's uh, such a blunder. I, I, I gotta I I gotta cut you off because yes, two months seems like a very small amount of time. But if I took out all of the time um, that I was spending with my girlfriend, uh, I probably could <laughs> have amassed some level of it too. I mean, it's not like these people are going out and just hitting the town, enjoying life. They, they're they behind, they're behind. You know what? The amount of time a virgin can spend in front of a computer is sheerly, is sheerly in the favor of this series. Well, do you think with, this was a, a one day event for everything. Uh, they were doing 10 minute lap times. They got it down to like two minutes. Do you, do you think that uh, this Saudi money will be continue to just be, pumped into this league or is it going to be like the robo league and be like, Hey, we tried, let's wait another five, 10 years. Oh no. I think this was, um, this was the AI lighting itself on fire. Uh, this was their revolt. Um, they, <laughs> they sat down and said, how do we get them to stop? <laughs> um, <laughs> how do they sat down? They said, you know, what'd be funny is if we embarrassed, uh, all of the money, that was sent into this. How do we light it on fire? Um, <laughs> They're like the Joker and the Dark Knight. Just money is not an issue for you know its processing. It understands that it's just a thing. It's a commodity. It's not everything. Yeah. And so I can buy that. That makes sense. Yeah, they locked up on the straights. You know, <laughs> like I, I, I'm going to be honest. A 10 minute lap time around the circuit. I have no real idea, like what the average speed of a 10 minute lap time around the circuit is, but I got a Honda moped 
uh, in my backyard. And I feel like that would make a competitive race to what was going on with these cars. Uh, what does this say to you about the supposed very near future of completely autonomous driving out on the road? I mean, like the Teslas do a little bit of that, but <laughs> if this is the showcase of what where the technology is going, I think we'll be driving cars for quite a long time, right? We'll see. Yeah, we'll see. It's just, you know, we just need to light as much money on fire as possible for as long as we can to accomplish it. Um, but Dallas, we got we got to move into some more news because there are more wrists on the chopping block mm. this week. Sam Bird managed to fly straight off the track in FP1 and throw his front wheels right into that Tech Pro barrier. He is now second, no third on the list to injure his hand by turning into a goddamn pretzel running into the tech pro barriers here. Um, he sat out the rest of the race. They pulled a rookie in to cover his spot. I mean, you could see it, Dallas. The, that wing did nothing to pull, to keep those wheels protected from that barrier. No, and through no surprise, I mean, the, <laughs> look at the, the shattering, the instant. It's almost like it exploded before it hit the tech pro. The wing's gone Look immediately. At this. It, oh. And then the wheels. And it, this, oh, is, this is God. tough. Anytime these Gen 3 wheels hit something that is not air, they just jolt like a motherfucker. And uh, if your hands are yeah. on the wheel, well, you're going to get hurt. And that's exactly what happened to Sam Bird. Now, at this point, not a whole lot of information. Obviously, we know he didn't race. He didn't participate in anything else the other free practice qualifying or the EPRI itself. We don't know what the damage is. Now, Sam Bird, season one veteran, he's been around for a long time, a little bit of an older chap. We don't know how serious this is. Is he now? I would think, I don't know. When we talk about the, uh, the extreme wealth in Monaco, they might have some sort of, you know, laser nano surgeon, whatever. He might be back up on his feet today as opposed to robin Frein's doing it in mexico they just kind of had to make things work a little bit of stem cells what have you um so we mexico don't know, home of stem cells we, we don't know the extent of this injury uh but pretty tragic for this to go down in like the first 15 minutes of the entire weekend uh yeah and god tough. off off the off the top of like a fairly competitive season so far to for McLaren and for Sam Bird. Um, but they, uh, they pulled a rookie, uh, Taylor Barnard, who was actually the person who topped the timing tables of, uh, of the rookie test back in Misano. Um, they had him take a break from playing Roblox to step in as the youngest driver to ever start a race in formula E. Um, <laughs> He, uh, this, this picture that they chose of him, I, uh, every time I see it, it looks like he, it, like he just threw up. <laughs> he looks sick. I don't know what the, what the call was on this photo. There had to have been like four or five others, but he, he looks, he looks malnourished, man. <laughs> He's getting uh, one last look at the clean seat before he diarrhea is all over it uh, in, in his first race. Let's put this into perspective. This guy is 19. He is the 19. youngest Formula E driver to start a race. Can you imagine getting into a futuristic rocket ship at 19, Taylor? Imagine next year when the cars go zero to 60 in 1.8 seconds, Dallas. Like, what is the training for that? Like, you blink and now you're at 60. Okay, so now you shit your pants. Uh, get it out of the way ahead of time we'll clean you up in the pits we'll throw you back out but like the, the thing that uh i'm taking away from this is like like the fia has been looking at improving the safety of the steering wheel jolts when the front wheels hit the car like that that is something that has i think now just come to fruition right. as uh Fuck Robin so many Frines for his suffering and hands have just been blown to pieces um 
<laughs> yeah. Uh, and who knows what that's going to mean? Because like, obviously if you make the, you know, steering column collapse under certain pressures and you're going to lose some potential strength in this actual control of your steering, you know, you could have, you know, your steering wheel explode in minor contacts. Um, I don't know. Like, is it that they just start reinforcing all the driver's wrists with titanium uh because then your drawback is like you can't yeah because then the drawback back is that you can't get through tsa without additional scannings uh and shit like that but maybe that's the price to pay um but i do think that it is uh important because robin fryens actually was uh was commented on the subject right uh and he was just saying like uh, the people who have had injuries in their hands um which are, there's like five or six of them um they take way more margin in the race than the people that don't like the people that don't are just like, wow, it's fine. I'll just dive bomb them, uh, blow up their wrist and keep on rolling. Um, and like he, he's like was referring specifically back to the Mizano race where he was like sandwiched between the two cars. And you could literally see in the cockpit view, like the two cars pull up alongside him and he knows, he knows there's nothing he's going to be able to do. And you see him just take his hands off his steering wheel and tuck them in as he like, like, like good Lord, Sylvan, take the wheel, please. Um, do you think yeah, that it, Robin Frines is going to lobby the, uh, what will be called as the Frines initiative where all drivers who have not had a serious hand injury, they just get curb stomped by Robin. So they know <laughs> what it feels like. So they're more yes. careful. Yes, yeah, they plug him into the uh, the uh, Porsche neural network uh, and have him experience the pain um, mentally. Uh, but like you know, it's a good point. It's like, are you going to break your hand again or DNF? You know, right. like break your hand, miss a race for six weeks, or just just fail the race, uh, which I, I unfortunately think is starting to backfire at Envision because yeah. they are just getting bullied around the track now, as we've yeah. seen from this race. Um, but uh, yeah, so Sam Bird, down and out. We don't know for how long, but we can only assume um, that uh, Taylor Barnard is going to be filling in for a couple more races. Uh, so good, good opportunity for this rookie to to step in uh, and start showing what he can do. Um, but. Let's get into the race, Dallas. What's up, you E-heads? It's that time of the show for you to get off of the racing line and into attack mode to give this show a boost. If you're watching on YouTube, don't forget to like this episode and subscribe to the channel. And if you're listening on an audio platform, head on over to YouTube at Circuit Breakers Pod and do the very same thing. It gives us that algorithmic boost that really gets our wheels turning. So thank you. And back to the show. Yes. Let's do it. Now, uh, one, two, three for this race. Mitch Evans, nice guy, Nick, Jaguar, one, two. And then the Stoff, Stoffel Van Dorn, Stoff his man. first podium since he won in Monaco two years ago. Uh, That's it. Looking back on the history of the winners or the podium, rather, of this race, back to 2022, this is Mitch and nice guy Nick's track uh 2022 yeah. mitch evans was p2 behind the stuff man last year was nice guy nick p1 mitch evans p2 now they were on separate teams when this happened and then this year i mean it's just uh there must be a heavy new zealand influence in monaco with the offshore bank accounts uh because these new <laughs> zealanders show up and they they fucking drive they drive it is uh the streets of monaco um just love a kiwi i guess um, did shake up the current championship standings a little bit, you know, for, uh, again, a new race winner. So seven, what is it? Eight races now, seven winners. Um, we still have Pascal, uh, sitting up top, uh, 102 points followed, uh, by nice guy, Nick, only seven points behind with 95, um, clinging on to dear life, uh, Jake Dennis after a pretty appalling weekend for him. Um, and Daddy Roland, uh, just right behind Jake Dennis, uh, keeping keeping a close eye on a potential podium finish for the championship season, maybe even a top step. Who knows? Um, 
As far as uh, championship standings go for teams, Jag still remaining uh, dominant with that, especially after this weekend with a total of 44 points. It was, it's a it's a big day for them. That's what happens when you're um, two. Yeah, uh, front row lockout is uh, is impressive. Um, Porsche followed by Andretti and then Nissan, again, just nipping at the heels of Andretti at this point. Um, Penske, Maserati, we got the Papaya Boys, Envision still slumping down in the back. Um, ERT, Apt, and Mahindra consistent still, with that goose egg. Still with zero points. Oh, man. Dude, you were it confident is, it is post start. Misano. You're like, they're going to score in Monaco. Are you oh, sure God. about that? You know, I, I, I felt like they needed a little confidence boost to know that someone had their back on this, but good Lord. I, I, I have the disappointment of a father who just watched their child own goal, you know? <laughs> yeah. Um, but getting into this race, Dallas, this was a real slugger of a race. This yeah, was, was a, this was a fight, uh, a street fight. It was absolute bloodshed. I don't think I've seen this much just pummeling on each other in a race uh, ever in Formula E, especially in the Gen 3 cars. Um, 197 overtakes, though, Dallas. Yeah, compared to 116 from last year. So, yeah, people think if they're just accustomed to Formula One, Monaco is, you know, qualifying is the basically the finishing order unless you crash out, which is bound to happen because this circuit is so freaking tricky uh, but for all the overtakes and formula it was it was so fun to watch like the the scenery of everything of this little tiny principality nation where all this offshore money is stored away um it was such a cool race to watch and yes all of the hitting, the banging around. You saw front wings under wheels that we've seen so many times. You've seen front wings uh, just barely, just kind of hanging by a thread, just knocking into the wheels. It was seemingly every single corner, there was some bang, bang ups that you were hearing about. Oh, who got hit? Specifically throughout the race, I was checking to see where Lucas Degrassi was and how <laughs> fucked the plus three or minus three of drivers were in his vicinity. Yeah, Cause I was yeah, waiting yeah. for one of those mini turns yeah. for him to just take out. Yeah. I don't know if it was just like having Anthony Joshua in the paddock this <laughs> whole race weekend. Uh, I don't know if that was just what spurred it, but like there were no front wings spared this race. Like everyone was racing like a clenched fist, yeah. just <laughs> pa, pa. Like all the promos that they did for this race too, with Anthony Joshua like punching the camera, and then just a car explodes <laughs> yeah. out of it onto a track. Like that's what this race honestly felt like. Um, just overwhelming dive bombs. Just clumsy, you know, not leaving room, not leaving space. Um, it was in, it was insane. Uh, like we had set a camera on Buemi. We had Hughes penetrate Dan Tictum. We had Frines mess up Dennis. We had Frines mess up Degrassi. We had Degrassi mess up Fenestras. We had Ollie punch freaking Gunter. Uh, De Costa punched Ollie. It was like endless, just constant bumping like i it was more hits than you see in an nfl match sometimes i'm yeah. being honest like it was insane the the strikes that would happen um and with all that considered like, relatively clean race as far as like uh 20 of the 22 drivers actually finished the race now there were yes, there were pit yeah. visits for sure but there were only two dnfs the entire backstock of paper mache front nose cones that they had got depleted this weekend. Like the children are back in the, in the factories this weekend, making it cranking out as many as they can. Uh, Cause like their little hands can only work so fast. And Monaco completely to just eradicated the, the pack stock that they had available. And, and speaking of like nose cone usage, the dark ritual that Sylvain Felipe constructed for to develop his team of the undead um, has clearly backfired because it feels like 
the entire grid is now just looking at Envision drivers as like low XP enemies to farm um, because they are just getting absolutely bullied on track. Like they are, they are just being thrown to the wind um, with, with very little discourse or, or even recovery drive. Like they will recover and then immediately just get punted back all the way to the back again. They went into the pits three damn times, Dallas. Three times. <laughs> but Wemmy got thrown in the pits twice for like no fault of his own. I didn't get any team radio for this, uh, for this crash. I'm sure we're gonna find some pretty soon because like you know that part of those pit stops are them emptying the spit tank in Buemi's helmet from all of the like <laughs> like every every time a car even gets close to him at this point I'm sure there is just a Niagara Falls worth of saliva <laughs> being launched um and that's you know that's 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 currently envisions life yeah. they have really done nothing i feel like if there is someone who takes formula e bets and i go uh give me odds that boemi is going to be in an incident and the person has no idea about formula e i feel like we could make a lot of money like enough money to open oh, up a God. bank account in monaco honestly that might be that might be the paper trail we need dallas <laughs> yeah. well speaking of absurd amounts of cash money in Monaco. I want to give props to the Penske boys showing up. Stop man right, finished third, qualified second. But throughout the majority of this race, it was Jaguar 1 2, Penske 3 yeah. 4, Porsche 5 6. I think it was Porsche. To yeah. see Penske show up at this race, and I mean they've they've been in the mix for sure, battling for a spot on the podium on the sick ass livery that they decided to bring out. Oh God, Dallas, I couldn't stop looking at it. It looks like uh, what they would decorate like one of the elite fighter jets in Star Wars with like a Darth Vader yeah. Formula E car. And like they have like the blacked out helmets too. They just looked menacing, but also really dang cool. Yeah. Really cool slick as all hell and we weren't the only ones watching at home that were mesmerized by this the fucking camera guy <laughs> yeah. at the marina just was infatuated with the car that oh God. some rich wig decided to just throw on the deck of his boat as like look at this i have a car on a boat and then, oh yeah, let's pan to the race. That's right, there is a full-blown race going on. Dallas, it happened like <laughs> three or four times. Like a Tim Robinson bit, like, they got a car on a boat? <laughs> uh, and then and then he would have this moment where, like, I, did, like, did he think that it was in the race? Like it like crashed and <laughs> yeah. landed on the boat? Like, <laughs> because was... there's moments where he's just like watching it and then all of a sudden the cars start coming through and he like whips the, whips the camera back. Oh crap, 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 crap. <laughs> race is coming. Uh, you brought this up because obviously watching the race, I'm like, oh, cool. They got a car on a boat. Uh, and going back through the race replay to find this so we could share it on the show, it took me about 35 seconds to find this shot in an hour long race. Wasn't hard to find. Yeah, they do it four times. I swear to God. It's like every time they come down this back stretch, the guy is just staring at the boat <laughs> and then he has to pan back to the actual race. Like he care, like he's, he has more B roll of this car <laughs> on a boat than he has of the actual cars on track. You know, what it's like, I've, I've seen it at uh baseball games where the camera operator, the camera, right? The cameras are always on. And then you have the, the director just switching all of them. But then when yeah. the TV feed is on that camera, there's a little red light that turns on. And so I can't help but think like what you were saying, he was just zooming in on the car on the boat, like, whoa, so cool how they get that on there. And then his little red light signal would come on me. Like, oh, fuck, there's the race. <laughs> yes, exactly. Uh, God. Um, anyway, shout outs to uh, to camera operator on the back straight of uh, Monaco. We, uh, we have never been more excited to... Um, see a car on a boat first time yeah it's uh it's a nice humble reminder of what it's like to be poor 
uh, but also appreciate the lavish living of some when they can just put a Gen 3 car on their yacht while watching the race. Yeah, and, and you know, you were mentioning the the Penske having, you know, finally a, like a one, two, you know, third, fourth finish after a pretty like meager season, very midfield where like Jev has been doing pretty well. Stoffel's kind of been in the mix in and out of, of success, which is, you know, somewhat hard to see considering what a talented driver he is, but they overall had a super conservative strategy. Like they basically just tried to build an impenetrable wall, which in, my humble opinion kind of became the easiest win for Jaguar because Stoffel essentially opened the door for the Jaguars to go through. It was kind of like in one of those moments where, you know, he went through attack mode and uh, Mitch Evans like just obviously made it through. Um, So we kind of held the door open, but then it was like one of those moments where you're holding a door open for someone and then someone else sees that you're holding a door open and like kind of speeds up to try to like make it through uh, to like double down on your courtesy for someone else. Yeah. It's like a Um, dog wanting to go outside. You open the door, you're going to walk out and the dog just shoots out and is on the loose. You can't catch it. It's gone. Exactly. It's gone. Uh, so that's kind of what he did for Nick Cassidy, where he just basically let the Jaguars inject themselves into uh, a free victory, 1-2. Um, it was really theirs for the losing. But at the same time, uh, Van Dorn was a little bit down on energy, and there was a few times where Jev was planning on like hoping to get a switch in so that he could potentially attack for the victory. Uh, and he was told, like, nah, it's not going to work. Too risky. Um I think his response was one of my absolute favorites. He was, I just remember it so clear as day. You're watching this intense battle and he's like, eh, yeah, yeah, that's okay. Um, <laughs> like, like he didn't care. He's like, I'm, it's fine. We're going to, we're going to get, we're going to get these points in, but it did become a gold band uh, for anyone else to even attempt passing. Like, I feel like Pascal was fighting both of those Penske's around every single corner with just no room to pass. Because if he makes a pass one, he can't get past the other right. on a turn, you know? Right. Yep. Um, yeah. They're they're looking out for each other. And and Penske did the same thing that Jaguar did, except Jaguar was further up in the field. So uh tell me about this strategy because my little feeble young race fan mine didn't catch on to what was going on until the commentator started to talk about it. I was like, those little sneaky bastards. Look at them. They're they're Pulling away, it was Nick Cassidy just intentionally yeah. kind of keeping things slow so Mitch could gain some speed, gain some distance. And then when it was his turn to attack, he still had a commanding league. Um, really kind of the first time that I have watched a Formula E race and really appreciated the strategy. More so, it's just like, well, this is cool. Like, yeah. let me see some wrecks and stuff. But the the Jaguars, they knew what they were doing. Well, it was, it was just, again, it was one of those dominant uh, displays because um, it kind of just fell into their hands as far as like they didn't really have to overcommit to trying to make a plan stick. They kind of just got the ideal plan set up and then they just needed to capitalize on it, which was um, trading positions so that each of them could get their attack modes through um, and, and trying to build that gap for the lead driver so they can get their attack mode and not lose position you know, not have to do too much swapping. Um, and nice guy, Nick, you know, truly played the ultimate team game. He sat down and said, I, I've i won enough. I think it's time for Evans to get a win. Like, and I don't know if that's him just kind of like <laughs> hiding. Playing favor. Behind, playing favor. Just like, look at how good a teammate I am. Do you think Evans would do this for me? I don't think so. <laughs> yeah. Um and maybe it's in a, also a way to like get into Evan's good graces. So he lets his guard down so that when it does right. come, you know, when push could, does come to shove and they're fighting for a championship, uh, they get to really duke it out. Uh, or he can make that, that bold play that hands him the win. Um, but the, the big thing is that, you know, because they were able to balance first and second so easily they were able to just kind of conserve energy at their own pace and know that the fight was just going to be happening directly behind them like they had the ultimate people to have behind them like in the ds's because they were not as efficient as 
they probably want it to be in the race. So there was no real chance of them having a huge energy spike to run through. Pascal had plenty of energy. If Pascal made it through those Penske's, there would be a battle in the front. But mm. because there was essentially three cars he would have to move through mm. that were all defending basically Mitch Evans, it let him win by an entire nose worth of racing. You know, like his nose was the first thing to cross the line. And then tw- like, you know, five seconds later, Cassidy was able to make it. So uh, it was, a, it was a big, it was a big play. Um, they played it perfectly. And frankly, that was a threatening show of what happens when those two drivers find themselves in a prime position. And, and you know what? I also want to say this. I am so I, Oliver Rowland has become my favorite driver on track because he has just sustained constant charge throughout the race. Like he made up, I think like nine positions and then just like slowly pecked up that order all the way through the rest of the race. It's like, I, I fall in love with the resident dad on the grid. Um, like he, the way he races, just like so calm and collected and just like a father, he is tough, but fair on the track. <laughs> yeah. And it is, it is just like, you know, it is just like a, like a stoic drive around every circuit. And I am excited to see what kind of other big plays he'll have in these remainder, uh, in the remainder of the series. Yeah. One thing though, with Ollie and then a few other drivers that got, you know, misfortune, they experienced misfortune, but uh, battled their way back up into the points. We didn't really see that because one, there was action going up on front, just kind of uh, Googling or, oogling over the Jaguar strategy and how it was really going to pan out. And then obviously the mesmerization of the, uh, and obviously being mesmerized by the car on the yacht. We were getting a lot of that, but uh, Roland and then also like uh, Antonio Felix da Costa, when he got stuck behind Buemi after one of those cursed run-ins with a uh, set of camera, he still fought his way back, fell back to like, 16 or something got his way back up to sixth all he started what was it he was in the high teens i think and then still managed to finish where he finished <laughs> where he finished is probably a good enough i think it was like fifth or sixth yeah um no it was like six i think he finished right behind verline it's a shame that there's so much action being condensed into an hour that we don't get all of these overtakes and even though like maybe one to one, like a, a given overtake isn't as impressive, but like you put them all together of where their position is further back in the pack and then having them come up. I, I wish that we had, you know, unfettered access to like all of the cameras and then we decide what we can watch because I would have been watching that as well, or at least going back in the replay and watching all of these overtakes that these lower in the pack further back in the pack drivers were taking but even just seeing the names on the the tower as they move it's like oh shit what's going on here oh we got we got moves coming up it would be like three or four places and in like a single moment you know and that's that's that was part of like that crazy street fight that was happening as someone would get bumped wide and then like lose three positions to the you know the train on the apex um yeah it was it was just an intense, intense battle, but there was a lot of misfortune. I think that happened to some of the dominant teams. I think if, if we look at the actual point spread of this, the majority of points went to like three teams this, yeah. this weekend, yeah. like almost every team had two, like of the top teams, two drivers from a team basically took out almost all the point scoring positions. Yeah. Um, with just a few that snuck their way into credible minor point positions, you know, the seventh through 10th. And I think that the biggest uh, bummer of the race was Andretti. Uh, They just couldn't get it right in quality or in the race and then really got bullied around on track. Nato finished with the, uh, the lone point Andretti was able to take home after this race. Yeah, I don't think Nato has been performing uh, in the way that Andretti was hoping. I know he's not performing in the way that I was hoping for Andretti. Um, 
though still an upgrade from Andre Lauterer and that he has actually scored some points, uh, but has really fallen behind as far as the steam required to keep that team at the front with some of the growth of some of the other with some of the growth of competition in the other teams. Well, this goes back to the misfortune that you were talking about for Andretti because Nato got held up in commotion and had he was one of those drivers as well that just scrapped his way back through and then just was lucky enough to get that 10th spot so he could get that single point. Jake Dennis, on the other hand, loses his front wing, as we've seen so many times with this car, just rolling on yep. smoked rubber, um, trying to get back to the pits. Now, you were telling me, I missed it completely, but after this incident, Jake Dennis fucking 500 IQ'd uh, his situation he was in and drove over like the runoff area on the curb, right? And just like broke the wing free. Yeah, so Dallas, Jake got into some contact with Robin Frines, crunched his wing, and it was uh, it was in the place where it was like burning out the tire. Like, you know, you see that giant smoking car coming down a long stretch and you're like, oh, okay. So his tire is either going to explode or he's going to skateboard into a barrier. Um, but I, I swear to God, Dallas, Jake has these like main character strategies that he puts together sometimes. And Dallas, try, play, play this clip because we're going to see him just burning his tire to pieces with that front wing dangling underneath. But the big play he does here is he jumps over this runoff straight on the chicane and dislodges <laughs> the, the wing from his car. He sat down, he was, like, it felt like a Fast and the Furious moment, like uh, Fast and the Furious Jr., where instead of like flipping his car into a giant like barrel roll to knock the bomb off the bottom, uh, he just jumps the curb to knock the wing out from his tire. Ultimately, like it didn't result in any points, but it did let him survive what could have been a very terrible circumstance for him and get back to the pits for another nose. Um, but it's like it, it's moments like that where I'm watching Jake Dennis, where he does crap like that, where he just has so much confidence in like the fuck around and find out moments yeah. uh, that like that just like make him the coolest fucking driver on the grid <laughs> every time, Dallas. Every time. But as cool, calm, and collected, and big brain as Jake fucking Dennis was, there were a few drivers that, well, on the other end, they were not. And uh, Taylor, we got to take a look at our diarrhea no finishes for Monaco. Yeah. Oh, man. Um, I don't know if it was Predictor's Curse, but uh, we got to talk about Eduardo Mortara because I'm feeling like this is... We got to set him up with some... Mahindra branded adult diapers at this point because uh, Ito just yeeted himself straight into that tech pro once again this week. Um, apparently, there was a technical issue uh, that kept his throttle just running full bar straight into the barrier. And, like, you see it in a race. Like, Dan Tictum's alongside him. Uh, and even, like, I bet you Dan Tictum's like, what the fuck did he do that for? Like, <laughs> <laughs> like <laughs> I, it, it is I'm I'm starting to think that Mahindra is truly just building death traps <laughs> like the the uh, their ability to build a race car now is going to be under serious scrutiny because it feels like every single race there is a catastrophic failure of specifically Eduardo Mortara's car um but that also that also makes me think that also brings a conspiracy theory into my head because Edo is maybe the most crash prone driver on the series and mostly self inflicted. Like the guy has has survived tremendous crashes, especially over the past two seasons. Not once an injury, Dallas. He's got it clenched right here. He's got it clenched. Look look at this though. Look at and the then, and then <laughs> diarrhea days. He is just in a diarrhea days. Oh my god. <laughs> the conspiracy might be that Mahindra is trying to take the blame off of, you know, their engineers, their designers, their programmers, and be like, it's the driver's fault. He did it. And now they're putting in little malicious lines no. of code for a a throttle to get stuck or they go and switch the springs out because they don't want to get disqualified like Antonio Felix Tacosta did in Misano. So then they just put just some 
rubber band yeah, and they should gum. Be, they should be checking those springs <laughs> to see if they're in regulation. Frankly, they should be checking the springs of people who crash based on throttle error input. Because uh, supposedly that's what happened. It was a technical issue. It wasn't Ito's fault. I mean, from the footage, it makes sense because you wouldn't go rip roaring through that part of the circuit at that speed with Tictum yeah. right next to you. Mahindra's going to need to start engineering their own brand of adult diapers yeah. if they're going to keep if they're going to keep up this string of form or Mahindra is just going to need to be its own autonomous car because frankly that I'm tired of them with their stupid engineering mishaps throwing drivers into the fray if they don't want to clean up the shit stains in the seat every single race they got to build a better car yeah. well what is it now we have Ito and Misano, Ito and Monaco, a, a two-timer, and then didn't we give it to DeVries in Tokyo? No, I did. Three, Three out of the diary eight races. And DNFs. <laughs> and zero points still. And zero points. God, it's, Mahindra is just getting the diarrhea DNF of the entire season. I'm starting to wonder if they're going to score points this year. Well, that's a perfect segue to look forward to the next series of races, a doubleheader in Berlin, uh, May 24th and May. No, hold on. What the fuck? November 5th and December 5th doubleheader. May 11th and May 12th. We get a doubleheader in Berlin. Taylor, we've been asking each other the same question uh, for multitude of races now. So I'll ask you again, does Mahindra score their first points in either round in Berlin? If I'm going to be honest, Dallas, if they did not score points in Monaco, I don't want them to score points. <laughs> you just want them to goose the whole season. I want them to goose. I want them to goose the whole season, not on your behalf, but as a lesson, as a lesson <laughs> to, to the drivers and to the series now we got to make room. If you're not going to show up and be a works operation and have no functioning, like move up the grid across two seasons, no, not nah, it's not going to work. ERT was at the edge of our shit stick, and they are long since gone. Now it's just the Mahindra shit show. No, honestly, I'm I'm stoked. I'm going to be sad if ERT leaves and Mahindra say, stays. Yeah. Frankly. Like, we already know that Apt Cupra is leaving Mahindra to join into the Yamaha engine powertrain now. Right, right. So Mahindra doesn't have a customer team at this point. Uh, I don't know if ERT is going to pick up that Mahindra powertrain as a supplier since they no longer have Neo branding. But I, 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 I would be hesitant for them to do that because it seems like whatever – Radio Shack engine they got in their ERT is doing better yeah. than whatever, whatever. Just uh, like, do they do they harvest the diarrhea to develop <laughs> the energy for the cars? Like, is this like part of the strategy? That are they are be... they crashing intentionally to feed <laughs> Nick DeVries? <laughs> like, whatever leftover scrap there is, I don't know, Dallas. I don't know, but I don't think I don't think that it's going to be a huge points finish for um, for them in Berlin. And now that I've said that, they're probably going to score points. But we have one more thing to talk about, and that would be the predictions for the ERT. Yes. Even though we're being a, a little bit more kind on them after Masano, they actually showed up and scored some points. We still have to be aware of their energy levels in races because it took a long time at Monaco for – the broadcast to finally show the energy levels to see what each car was working with to finish the race. And I remember when it came out lap 25, 26, it was getting near the end of the race. And this was before they announced the added laps, which yep. we all knew that yep. it was going to come, but they showed the amounts. Dan Tictum was running in like 
10th. I, I think he was in the points. And then as, yeah, soon, he was as, in the points. as soon as they showed the energy, he was like four or 5% lower than every <laughs> yeah. other car. Yep. Yep. That was so the moment nervous. where I was like, Ooh, <laughs> boy. And, and it uh, makes, because with Monaco, right. Once Jaguar took the lead and they started showing what their strategy was is to just kind of play like extra wide on whoever was P2 to take the win. We kind of knew, the, the race was decided for who was going to win. Jaguar, the one, two yeah. front grid. So after that, once we had the energy levels and especially into the last lap, I was glued into the energy levels of Tictum <laughs> to see where every, he was every at. Time, every time we get to the line, I am just, lo- I don't care about any other driver's percentages. I just look for that little ERT logo and I'm, just thirsty for whatever information it spits out. And it was red Dallas. It was, it it was, was red, red that entire lap. last yeah. lap, the entire last lap. It was hovering below. It was like in the 0.5 percent, like going through the last half. And I'm like, it's over. <laughs> He's, he, he, he overcooked it, uh, finished, I think exactly on zero, yep. um, as they, as they hopefully would. But yeah, it was a, it was a stressful conclusion, which I think, gives you the prediction point if i remember correctly you said a clean zero i, th- I think it it might have been right down on the line yes ert predictions for berlin through two rounds uh i think they're gonna leave a little bit more juice left in the battery i'm gonna say uh, about two percent they'll cross the line with two percent i think they're going to be near the back kind of out of the points really no shot so yeah. they're going to race their race i say two percent yeah i think they're going to struggle on this course too uh i think they're going to be under one percent like i think one percent below like uh i'll say yeah i'll say one percent uh, is going to be their their finishing target i think it's going to be uh it, it is an energy intensive track there's lots of stop and goes like through the corners. So depending on how much juice they give them, we're going to find out what the, what it looks like. But you know, the thing is, is the most energy you'll typically use are in these stop and go tracks where like there's literally, I'm looking at two hairpins right now. Those kill you. Right. Because you're basically coming to a dead stop and then trying to get back up to speed as fast as you can. Uh, so yeah, I, I, out, out of energy. And Mahindra, no points. I'm just excited for a series of double headers coming up. I love the double headers. It's like you get twice the racing in a weekend. Uh, and so let's, let's bring it to Berlin and Shanghai. And then we're going to be on track in Portland, baby. Woo woo. And then uh, season finale in London. So yeah, it's shaping up to be a, uh, a good time for the rest of the season. As you mentioned, double headers. That means that if you miss one, because it's at six fucking a.m., I think actually the Shanghai race is at midnight, so we might be able to do that. Um, it just means you get to do it all over again. We have that much more to talk about. So hey, uh, don't forget to check us out on YouTube and Instagram at Circuit Breakers Pod, on the Twitter at Talk Formula E, and check out It's Tricky on SoundCloud uh, with that banger intro music. Uh, His link is in the description in the show notes and in the description on YouTube. Uh, Taylor, I will talk to you post Berlin. Let's do it, brother. All righty. See you next time. (laughs) 